So, firstly, uh, sorry that it took so long to get going. Um, we have some AV trouble, <laughs> as usual. I'm deliberately walking where I was told not to walk, just to annoy him, because I've known him for years. Besides, uh, as well as that, this is probably going to be my last time I'll be talking at a conference, certainly in the foreseeable future, because uh, my work rules have changed. So I either get to go to standards committee meetings or I get to go to conferences, and I'm sorry, you guys, but uh, standards committee meetings are probably more important for me in the next, next few years. Uh, so yeah, um, thanks very much for coming. I know this is a bit of an anodyne sort of topic, but uh, ultimately it's how do we get share, or sorry, memory maps into, into the C++ <laughs> language. And uh, that's, that's where things get fun. So first thing, I'm gonna go and do a bit of background. Uh, I'm going to attempt to summarize the C++20 object and memory model, and that would be the addressing form of that interpretation of memory model rather than the concurrency form. Uh, I'm probably going to do a terrible job at it, so that's going to be full of mistakes. I can already tell there's going to be a Reddit thread full of all of the different mistakes I've made. Um, I'm really not good at this stuff. Um, I mean, for example, who knew that um, a, a pointer value is not, not the same as an object? Nobody's putting their hand up. Well, I'll tell you something, I didn't know that, and I've only been working in this, this area for like 20 years or something. <laughs> you know, I discovered this recently, that pointer values are not necessarily pointer objects. So that was a surprise. Um, and then I'm gonna get into virtual memory. Uh, I'm gonna do a terrible oversimplification of the description of it. Uh, but it's kind of important to understand where computing systems have got to and where C++ is not. So I will attempt to do that. I'm going to just talk a little bit about memory elsewhere to here. Now, Michael Wong just finished a talk there where he did a pretty good job of talking about heterogeneous compute. So I'm probably going to not go into as much of that as uh, perhaps I would have ordinarily done having just come out of Michael's talk. Uh, but it's not dissimilar. Uh, you have lots of little computers all talking to one another nowadays in modern computing systems. And um, we need to get the language to support that kind of stuff. So after I've gone through that, and that's about the first half of this talk, is, is just basically recapping stuff that most of you probably already know, but it's just to freshen it in your mind, and I'll try not to bore the pants off you. Uh, and then I'm going to try and get into papers. Now, I'm a bit of an unusual situation, because normally when I come and do these talks, uh, I've been working on an implementation for months, often years, so I would know it reasonably well. Uh, these papers aren't even published yet. They're literally drafts that have been circulating around uh, behind the scenes. So they, they probably are really wrong, and uh, I can certainly see if, if, luckily, there's not too many people from the Standards Committee here, which I'm really glad to see, because otherwise I was expecting questions and sort of, you know, corrections happening. But hey, you know, we'll see what happens. Anyway, the first one does actually have a number at least. So um, if I get up the pointer there, you'll see uh, it's 1631. It's not published yet, so you can't actually see it, but it will be in the July mailing. Uh, I'm taking it over to uh, WG14, uh, so that's the C Standards Committee meeting in London at the end of the month. Because we're going to run it past them too, because it'd be great if they could also do memory mapped uh, file support, and to give them an idea of where things are going. So I've got a sort of very early draft, that's why I needed a paper number. Uh, as part of the current draft, I actually have these two papers combined together, the page-based object storage. Uh, it's going to get split out into a separate paper, and uh, it doesn't have a number yet, but it will have by July and that's hopefully to segment things out. And then what I will not be talking about, even though I really planned that I was going to, was provenance-aware memory model for C2X. Uh, so I don't know if you guys are aware, but C has been working on a reform to how pointers can be interpreted to alias memory or not, right? And you kind of go, ooh, this sounds you know, really, really worrying because how much code's gonna break, okay? The good news is that I think, and I'm gonna put my hand up and say I think, what they're proposing, even though no one says this, but I ran through the C++ standard and through their paper, and as far as I can tell, and I'm probably wrong, they're basically actually saying they've gotta bring C up to match the same memory model as C++. <laughs> Which is great, because there's been an ever-yawning gap growing between the two of them over time. So because of that, there's not really a huge amount of point of talking about it hugely in detail, because it's basically, they're gonna do what C++ does already. So, you know, uh, I as a result just crossed it out. Uh, also, I don't really understand it, to be honest. Um, on the undefined behavior study group, people keep correcting me, and I'm there like going, well, you know, this is the way it is. 
And it turns out that no, no, no Nile, it's really wrong. So I just want to <laughs> talk about that. In a, I think it's going to go onto an internet video. OK, so uh, here comes Nile's best summary of the C++20 abstract machine. So first things first, it's, not, it's, it's unfair to say this. It's really unfair to say it, but it's not untrue. Really, to be absolutely honest, we're basically observe, uh, emulating the observable behavior of the original PDP 1120 back in 1971-ish. And now I know that's a really bold thing to go and say, and people are going to go, ah, oh, but that's not really the case. You know, I mean, you can do concurrency, you can do threads, you can do other sorts of stuff nowadays. And I'm like, yes, 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 this is true. But you have to bear in mind that, that CPUs are also designed to emulate the 286, the 186, which themselves were reduced subset clones of the PDP-11. So if you actually look at your brand new top of the range Intel whatever, uh, including a lot of the ARM cores, they are actually emulating a memory model. That's because all the software runs on a memory model because C does and C++ does and everything else. Java even does. So as a result, it's unfair to say this, but it's not completely inaccurate. You look through the memory model description at the front of the C++ standard and it probably could still run on the PDP-11. Now, it's funny that you happen to mention this, because I actually found this guy who had ported C11 to the PDP-11, as in taking a C11 compiler, and they have it running on an original PDP-11. And you're kind of wondering, well, why would somebody do that for? And it turns out that this guy has a support contract for these PDP-11 mainframes running until 2050. And he doesn't want to be writing KNRC <laughs> on this. So he ported a C11 compiler to it, and he's compiling C11 into PDP-11, and it's running. So there are actually people out there who are still running PDP-11s um, until 2050, <laughs> which just makes your mind boggle. But hey, there you go. Um, do you know, if you actually get into the internet and go and search for um, plug-in cards for the Unibus on the PDP-11, you can plug in a Raspberry Pi, because someone went and built a Raspberry Pi extension board that you can plug into a PDP-11, and people are actually doing that. So they're actually coming along and going, plug, plug, plug. And you're thinking, but surely Raspberry Pi has got like 20,000 times the compute power of a PDP-11. Why would you want to do that? I don't know. Anyway, it's, it's, you know, if you're bored, it's worth, worth reading about. Uh, anyway, the concept behind the PDP-1120 uh, is that ultimately, memory is a single flat space. There's equal access latency between all different parts, and all parts are equally reachable. So this is a real problem for the GPU guys at the minute, because each of those little individual cores that Michael Wong was talking about last, last talk, they only see a little tiny subsection of memory. Uh, they have very limited access to see other bits of memory that's in any way performant. So the fact that the memory model says that this must be so, and the entire language is built about that this must be so, creates problems like TLS is the classic one. So thread local storage is assumed to be equally available from all threads. And that is a consequence of this assumption. Every live object up until C++20 uh, has a single unique address within that memory which can be referred to by a pointer of that type or a void pointer. Slightly changed in C++20 in a way that's not really very important for this talk, but you can actually say that every single alive object has a unique address. Now you might think to yourself, well that's, that's, that's not a problem, but think about it. If you have more than one program uh, and that object lives at a different address within that program, you cannot represent that within the abstract model. Because in the abstract model, every object has the same one unique identifying address. It has to be the same address. And that's not doable on today's systems. So this is a major problem for doing shared memory. You, you can't do it with the current abstract model, which is one of the reasons why all the memory mapped proposals and shared mapped proposals that come before the committee have all been rejected. OK, so this is my best attempt of understanding the first 20 or 30 pages of the standard. Uh, the totality of all the live objects within the memory represent the program's current valid state. I think that's true. Programs are a time incremental stream of sequence points where objects are transformed from one valid state into another valid state through the application of operations onto those objects. I think that is also true as a reasonable summary. It's probably not completely accurate, but mm, bear with me. Sequence points are defined, well, they're defined as a whole lot more complexity than this, but I think they basically mean that they are reordering barriers. So if operations have observable side effects, then sequence points in the abstract machine say you cannot reorder these things 
across one another. That's basically what they mean, I think. Does that seem reasonable to everyone in the room? I thought someone now was going to correct me. Okay, cool. And that's how they did the threading, by the way. So the threading support that was brought in with C++11, you still have the same sequence points. You now define that whenever two threads interact with one another, they have these sequence point relationships. But otherwise, they run off and do their own thing separately. So that's how they managed to extend the abstract model to handle concurrency. It's a very interesting choice of how to do concurrency. You could actually have done it in many other different ways, but they would have broken existing code. Many would say that if they had done them different ways, then you'd get much safer code, which has far fewer problems with race conditions, but the ship has sailed. Okay, here's another interesting one. Um, only the program may apply operations to objects. That's the current C or C++ program. It's very interesting. Nowhere else can objects be modified. Um, only the C++ program that's currently running. And that, that's not stated so much as it's definitely an implicit built-in assumption into the abstract machine. I see Anthony putting his hands up to tell me I'm wrong. Sorry, say again? Apart from volatile objects. Do they not count as I.O.? I agree with that assessment, actually. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I do think they fall under I.O. under the traditional abstract machine that they were counted because of the PDP-11. It was unique that it was the very first, I think, major system to have directly mapped I.O. objects. And so they had to come up with this idea of memory that could permute itself. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Anyway, I hadn't thought of that, so thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, that's an interesting. There is only one C++ program in the C++ standard, as in there ever can be. Uh, it's really interesting. There is no possibility that the C++ program can run a second time unless it's absolutely identical to the first time. So every time it starts, apart from I.O., it's the only thing that's allowed permit, permitted to modify how a C++ ro program runs. It's very interesting. You can't have more than one. Um, I'll get back to this in actually just a second. But also, objects cannot be the program itself. So if you come along and you say, oh, do you know what we should really do to like, really make a cool new enhancement of modules is that we could make dynamically loadable modules. And the way we could do that is that we could make them into objects. And you just see horror <laughs> emerge from the people in the abstract machine. Because it's like you now got self-referential abstract machine. You just can't do that. So objects cannot be the program itself. You cannot have bits of code or anything that looks like code or program be an object under the current abstract machine. Ah, yes, yeah, here comes more fun stuff. So here's the other trouble with, with uh, C and C++, is that memory consists of bytes. It's like literally the opening paragraph of the memory model. And object storage is always, I put zero or, because that was added in C++20, uh, one or more arrays of bytes. So there's actually discontinuous objects in C++ under the abstract machine. And they are problematic, because you um, they're not just bounded within one single linear range of bytes. Also, there's padding, because one of the interesting things of the PDP-11 back in the day was that it was a bit crap at doing non-twos powered <laughs> increments. So as a result, when they were doing out arrays, they made a very simple array indexing operator, which meant that all of the objects could be packed together, and they had to be indexable contiguously. And the corollary of that is you have to get structure padding coming out of that, because if you don't put the padding between the objects in an array, you have to put the padding within the actual objects itself. And this leads to an interesting sort of outcome that parts of a structure matter, and other parts of a structure don't matter. So the padding bytes, for example, uh, can differ between two structures, but the two structures under C++ can compare equal. Now, that might not sound like a particularly important thing, but if you're trying to compare something quick and you're using byte comparison between the two, then the padding bytes can get in the way. And this then causes lots more complexity to turn up within how do you evaluate equality of, of two, two objects. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. here we go. So now, the, the standard uh, is quite strict about what lifetime and storage duration is, but I'm going to paraphrase it into something a bit simpler. First thing is that you have program lifetime duration. So that starts with the start of the program, that static data initialization. You have thread lifetime duration. That lasts from the start of a thread to the end of a thread. 
You have stack frame lifetime duration. And before someone corrects me, there is no stack in C++. True, but there is stack unwinding in C++. So you can have no stack, and there are C++ implementations out there that have no stack. Uh, and what happens is the compiler will statically compile out your program and basically emulate there being a stack, but there is no stack. But stack unwinding has to work, so destructors have to fire when you unwind the stack. There's also this thing which I've added, uh, which isn't really strictly speaking in there, but it's actually an expression lifetime temporary duration. So while you're evaluating an expression, the storage of that can actually be in CPU registers, and it's not exactly said anywhere in the abstract machine that that's the case, but I think I'm correct in inferring that that's actually the case. Um, nobody seems to be correct to me, cool. Uh, and then finally, the other lifetime is programmer managed, so that's the classic old malloc. Currently in the current abstract machine, no object lifetime exceeds the program. Cannot currently be done. And that made sense, because in the PDP-11, you fired it up, it ran. To finish this program, it stopped. So why would you need anything more? OK, so seeing as Anthony's in the room, he's probably going to go and correct me some more. But here we go. Um, something interesting about the concurrency model I referred to earlier, and I kicked it off until now, is that data between the threads is assumed that it can mutate. So very specifically, there's no hard const in C or C++. You can always cast off your const. That has really large repercussions for thread safety and a number of other things. It introduces lots of issues. But equally, if you, it, it gives the programmer the choice. So if you, the programmer, decide that you really do want hard const throughout your entire kind of thing, you can go ahead and do that with this model. Equally, if you decide that you don't like hard const, you have that choice too. So if the programming language forced hard const on you, you would now not be able to do soft const applications. So I can see where they were coming from. I've kind of already mentioned about how there's only one C++ program at a time. But if you give the same I.O., all valid C++ programs, according to the standard, should have identical observable behavior. So it's not about the path that you travel, but rather about the destination that you reach, I think is a reasonable summary of that. Is that reasonable, Anthony? So it may have different valid states at sequence points between program start and end, but identical observable behavior. Are you sure that's permitted? Yes. It depends on what you define as observable behavior, yeah? <laughs> yes. So OK, assume that that's wrong. <laughs> And I'll press on. <laughs> uh, as I say, I'm really not good at the abstract machine. I've learned just how much I don't know. Uh, I did a lot of searching around to try and find some good further reading for ever, you know, to recommend to go and read, and I actually could find very, very little. Most of the conference talks that say that they're about the abstract machine are not. They barely get into it. Uh, they usually talk about the concurrency side of things and don't talk about the non-concurrency side of things. But one that I did find, which does actually talk about the non-concurrency side, was Patrice Roy's uh, talk here. Now, the only trouble is that the audio is terrible on this video. And you're sitting there, and you often have to repeat it back and play it again and again to try and figure out what he's saying. And I found that very frustrating. But I did find the talk very useful, because there's a whole load of other mistakes that were in an earlier version of this talk, which I managed to delete and replace after watching this. And I nearly, I think, mostly got it right. All right. OK, so that's the end of that bit. Now I have to cover a virtual memory in like, oh, Jesus, five, six slides. Yay. All right, so something that's really important, and we're only having a talk about this this lunchtime, funnily enough, um, is that Virtual memory, despite having been invented around about 1970 by, uh, is it PJ Denning or something like that? Um, it took a long time to kind of come in, but it really is one. I mean, for the last 20 years, all the major desktop and mobile systems are using it. A good chunk of the high-end embedded systems. I used to work for BlackBerry, and Qnix uses it, and it's running there on you know, space rovers and satellites and things. You know, I don't know if they actually have, of course, the virtual memory turned on for that. Uh, the origination of virtual memory, uh, I actually did some calculations. This $4 a byte, which is just a crazy amount to think about for the PDP-11, um, that's in today's money. So literally, it was $4 a byte uh, to get yourself this quite fast memory. Even by today's standards, RAM was quite quick, actually. And then your hard drive uh, came in at 0.001 bytes. That's around about $1 for a kilobyte, 
was hard drives back in 1971, which really makes you think, you know, just how much technology has improved since then. But one of the key things was that you wanted your system to run really, really well. If you wanted reliability, in fact, this was just something that myself, uh, Guy, was, Guy Davidson was only saying uh, this lunchtime, was that when you're building a game out for a console, you have four gig of RAM, and that's it. And if you exceed that amount of RAM, your, your game just stops working. And then you're finding all the developers are fighting one another to go and get out two kilobytes of RAM, I think it was, was what you were saying, you know, where people were actually getting into shouting matches in, in the car park to go and get that. And one of the things that you was a great boon to reliability of systems was the just-in-time ability to substitute high-latency cheap RAM, which you, you'd probably have more of, for the low-latency stuff. And that's been the case for all computing systems the last 20 years or so. And the thing is, this is now one. Uh, it took a very long time to win because it was very controversial. It was only standardized two years ago, believe it or not. Now, a lot of people go, was it only two years ago? And the answer is that back in the very first POSIX standard, it was an optional addendum. So it was one of those uh, optional parts that you could choose to standardize or not. Uh, but in 2017, they went, looked at the existing systems, and they said, no, if you want to be POSIX compliant, it's 2017 standard, you now implement virtual memory because it's now ubiquitous. It's standard. It's one. Uh, now, I know there's a whole lot of people who are going to get really upset about the fact that's the case because it introduces all sorts of latency spikes throughout you know, your, your program. People don't like the fact that you know, you've got all of this going on, but it is what it is. So the question is, is what are we going to do about it? <laughs> so 64-bit um, address space is composed of various things, varying size pages on all of the major architectures. Uh, on x64, it's 4K, 2 meg, 1 gig. And I put in brackets 5, 12 gigs. I think that's an option which kernels can choose to implement, but almost I don't think any, any kernel does. So it, it causes an extra layer of uh, TLB lookup during a page table walk, so they just don't implement it because you don't probably need 5, 12 gig pages. CPU's MMU goes and maps these things. So when you run into a page that is currently not in the TLB, uh, the CPU will go off wander down these pages that have been set up by the kernel and it'll figure out what the physical page is that maps. Uh, if it then tries to go and access it and find there's no actual memory there, the kernel will intercede and will go off and fetch a page and put it there for you. Um, you can mark pages at the hardware level as never fault, fault on read, fault on write, don't fault, long things, this, things like that. It's basically kept in a set of bits. So if you programmed one of these, um, I'm sure probably most people in the room have actually written some page table implementations in the past and have written a page fault handler. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool, cool. It's fun. Reentrancy is a bitch, is all I'm going to say. And you see, as soon as anyone laughs, you know what I mean, because reentrancy is such a balls. One of the problems is you can put the page tables and you have to have them paged out to disk sometimes in order to space constraint system. And then what do you do? Because you're like, you know, you're stuck. You don't know what you need to look up, but you have to recurse back into yourself. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, virtual memory is lazy. Uh, unallocated address space is just always fault. So if you go off and you talk to some randomly bit of memory that hasn't been allocated, then you know, just kill the process, or 6 heg v is the classic thing, or sig bus as the case may be. New memory allocations, there's actually a single 4K page kept by the system that's just all bit zero. When you go off and you call mmap, it will just simply take that one page and it'll just map it repeatedly right throughout the entire address space that you just went and allocated. There's no real memory there. It's just the same page mapped in again and again and again and again. When you come along, and you first write to that page, so when you read it, you're just going to read that one page. As soon as you write into it, page fault handler kicks off, operating system kernel goes and takes one of its free pages that keeps kicking around, maps it into that place, restarts the, the application. And you never even see that, but there's just this huge latency spike of, oh, it's about 6,000 CPU cycles. Off the top of my head, I could be completely wrong on that. I vaguely remember it's roughly about that. I know that most kernels keep a um, quick access cache, of empty pages ready to go, and that's about two and a half thousand CPU cycles off the top of my head. But if it doesn't have any spare, it will have to go off and zero one and map it in. And then if you look at it, the actual RAM consumption is not what it claims. What your actual RAM consumption is going to be the total number of written at least once pages. So you can go off and you can allocate in your memory allocator two terabytes of RAM. Probably that's going to succeed in a 64-bit system. But your actual application usage, if you go and look inside your task manager, is not going to be two terabytes of RAM. It's going to be however many pages you've actually written to. And that's an enormous difference, because that changes how you run out of memory. It changes a long list of stuff. So yes, kernels read and write from storage in 4K, occasionally 2 megabyte pages. So if your filing system's there, uh, your device is there, it'll yank the stuff in and out. 
Uh, PCIe, so that's PCI expression, has been specifically designed around that 4K assumption. So you can do a full 4K uh, PCIe transaction uh, in a single PCIe cycle. So it does 4K. They chose 4K, Intel did, because that's literally what you spend almost all of your time doing with disk drives and so on and so forth. Everything's 4K. Might go to 2 meg in the future, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, kernel cache patches is the bits that are mapped in, just different pages. Uh, memory mapped files are implemented by simply taking bits of the kernel page cache and mapping it into your uh, user space process. Single unified page cache architecture has won. There was a huge debate for a very long time about whether you should have a cache for memory mapped files and a separate cache for files and a separate, you know, segment the stuff. Every single major operating system has a single cache for everything. It's one. No doubt about it. Uh, I'm just thinking Qnix and NetBSD are the only two that I can think of of any significant user base which don't have that yet. Um, and that's only because in Qnix you can turn it off. So they want to be able to turn off memory fat files but keep uh, file system caching turned on. You've got exactly the same system for virtual memory, uh, sorry, for file mapping as you do for allocating new memory. You start up a process, you might have none of this stuff is allocated at all. So what happens there is that every time the CPU goes off and reads something, it'll fault something in, it'll get pulled in from the storage device as it goes. Uh, and what you do is you mark every one of these pages that comes in from files as fault and write. On the very first write, you set the dirty bit, and then every n seconds, now such an oversimplification in a modern system, but this is the way it was in Unix about 10, 15 years ago. All dirty pages are written out of storage, you simply clear the dirty bit, uh, and you go back to where you were, and that lets you write to your uh, pages and memory mapped to IO. Read and write, for reading and writing files, just do a mem copy nowadays. Unless you're in O direct mode, they're just mem copying exactly the same as if you did it directly on a unified page cache architecture. There's no real reason to use that, you might think, but they actually, they implement locking semantics. There's actually an acquire and a release, atomic uh, sequential ordering going on in there. So that's a good reason to use those two if you want to have um, the kernel implement your locking for you. So that's the only other main reason. And finally, actual RAM consumption is the number of read at least once pages. I should really mention something very quickly about the swap file. Private pages uh, are actually allocated usually on first write. Now, there are some variations on that theme, but this is a simplified uh, recounting of virtual memory. So what you do is you reserve the space, and then if you run out of space in terms of physical RAM, you swap pages over. I think you should all probably know this. You only run out of memory when the space to swap file is gone. Now, what's interesting here is that even if you have top of the range storage, so if you just buy yourself there one of the brand new Samsung Z SSDs, which is a PCI 4 interface on it, it can do about 12 gig a second. No trouble. The latency is minuscule. But the trouble is that even if you compare it against main memory, you're talking there 500 nanoseconds to do a PCIe transaction, because that's how long PCIe takes. And you look there at main memory, it can do it in 25 nanoseconds. So anything that's connected by a PCIe bus, it's going to be high latency no matter what you do until they replace PCIe. After that, of course, when you're swapping, you're going to have to swap the pages over. That involves memory copy. And then you're going to have to shoot down a TLB. So all of this stuff here shows that you're going to be slowing down your application even on the very fastest storage. It's going to be running 20, 30, 50 times slower if asked to go out to the swap file. So if you run out of physical RAM, you're still going to see a massive slowdown in your application. And then, of course, if you're on spinning rust, bleh, add five zeros to all of that you know, because it's hideously slow. OK, uh, if you haven't read this 130-page tomb, because, of course, we all are very dedicated programmers, and we have nothing else better to do with our time, this is very good, actually. Uh, you will learn quite a lot of stuff, even though it's quite an old document. Uh, 2002, 2005, you wrote it. Um, it's written in, in, in his special, inimitable style, is all I can say. So, um, and people laugh know what I mean. But no, no, it is very valuable. You, you learn a lot of uh, very interesting stuff. And that, by the way, is the link. All right, so far so good. I'm just going to grab a little bit of water there. Ah. OK, we're finally getting into some new stuff. So, elsewhere memory. So I was rewriting this during Michael Wong's talk, so I hope it's going to come out OK. It's the least practiced part of it. <laughs> it's been a fun few weeks. New job, very busy. Just don't have the time to go and get these things done, as I usually would do. Uh, when you're a contractor, the great advantage is you can set your own time. 
As a permanent employee, you get so much less time, especially when you're ramping up in a new code base. I was trying to push out standards papers and, of course, childcare. So uh, anyway, I'm glad I made it, so we'll see what happens. So uh, as Michael was talking about last, last talk, that's why I had to rewrite this section, because he reminds me of a whole lot of stuff which I hadn't thought about. <laughs> um, you're getting an ever-increasing number of dedicated CPUs. So even the CPU that runs your keyboard nowadays has a surprising quantity of computing power in it, and all it has to do is register key presses. But the reality is the very cheapest microprocessor that you can buy you know, already has oodles of programming uh, compute power in it. You know? So as a result, even if you look at a USB controller, um, they're all quite programmable nowadays. You can buy yourself a little CPU that runs a, CPU, a USB controller, and you can program it to do evil. So there's actually a whole dedicated subgroup of people out there on the internet who spend their time reprogramming USB controllers to completely foobar any machine that you plug them into, like, you know, mess with electronics, inject, you know, viruses, surprisingly scary stuff. Um, it's like the stuff you see off movies, you know, where they come along with USB drive and somehow they manage to plug it in and just take over the computer, which is completely unrealistic. Yeah, well, after you've been reading these guys, it's not quite that bad, but it's kind of, you know, you can see smoke coming out of the computers they plug it into, which is not good. So, yeah, don't do that. Um, but interestingly, uh, how many people are familiar with shingled hard drives? Oh, down at the back we have one from the AV people. Shingle hard drives are both terrible and wonderful. <laughs> they're terrible because they're cheap, uh, and they're also wonderful because they're cheap. So the way they work is that they have a really, really terrible write performance. I mean, about 10 megaseconds. Awful, terrible write performance. But what they do is they make it appear like it's a normal hard drive by putting a standard hard drive platter, a PMR is a perpendicular rec recording one, of about 20 gig. So basically, there's a 20 gig buffer that sits in front. And when you do a write to one of these hard drives, if you do a random I.O. write, it'll just blat it all into the PMR cache, right? So it looks like it's going super duper quick. And then offline, it will transfer the stuff off the PMR cache onto the shingled part in the background, and it will take however many hours is required to go and move the full 20 gig over. So if you go and fit one of these things and you write the first 20 gig, which is about the size of a DVD movie, super fast. It then spends the next six hours rattling away in the background, actually storing this stuff out. And if you go over the 20 gig limit, your, your write speed drops to nothing. But the CPU requirement to go and implement all of this is very, very similar to an SSD. And if you look at what, uh, I don't know about other people's uh, hard drives, or sorry, uh, but I can tell you about my own, which is a Seagate. So I have a series of Seagate uh, shingled hard drives. And the CPUs that are on them uh, are about 1.7 gigahertz, two ARM7, or that area of Cortex, if you know thing. But they're running at 1.7 gig gigahertz. They're actually quite beefy. There's a fair bit of compute power inside them. Uh, they're about the same sort of compute level you're getting in an SSD. So if you buy a uh, Samsung SSD, it'll usually have three 1.5 gigahertz ARM CPUs inside there. It's quite a bit of processing power. They're all obviously running C and C++, which is even more interesting. Um, and you have to think about it. You know, you're actually fitting to these hard drives a mobile phone from a few years ago, or one or two of them. You know, graphics CPUs became very powerful a long time ago, as Michael was pointing out. Even if you're looking there at network dry, um, cards, if you're getting into the higher performance ones, they tend to have fairly beefy CPUs on them. Um, one of the responsibilities of my new job is we are going to be moving quite a lot of compute onto the network card. So um, you can actually program them, interestingly, for some of the higher ones, higher end ones. So you can write them out in computer programming language, and you can actually send programs that run on the actual network card itself, literally at the point where the network ingress point is. Uh, and that lets you do lots of stuff in the even lower latency. So we're talking there, you know, get under the 500 nanosecond area. And as I mentioned, the USB controllers have quite a lot of memory bandwidth nowadays. So what's becoming ever more important in these bundles of dedicated purpose CPUs? Bandwidth is constantly going up. We're constantly trying to push down, you know, latency to transfer data between these things. And that's the trouble, is getting state between these CPUs is getting harder and harder in any high performance fashion. So ultimately, we need to share memory between these CPUs. And I think everyone in this room has probably already bought into this, otherwise you wouldn't be here. And the question then becomes is how does this get implemented in current systems? So we currently have copy-based, as usually done by the kernel. So you have memory in some other CPU, and you need to get it from there to here. What you do is you institute a DMA. So direct memory access, you say, DMA controller, take the memory from over there and bring it over here as fast as possible and tell me when you're done. Some old systems are still using PIO, and basically it's not DMA. <laughs> it does the same thing. 
Uh, there's an op lock caching that can happen. So what you do is that when you take a copy of a memory on a different CPU, you say to the other CPU, tell anyone else who's going to be using your memory that I currently am using this thing. So I'm going to make a local copy here, and I'm guaranteed that the fire CPU is not going to go modify it without telling me. And if they do, they're going to send over a request and say, yeah, somebody else wants access to this memory. Uh, you need to tell me your copy now. I'm going to need synchronizing DMA back again uh, because you know people are now going to share. So um, Samba, interestingly, implements this in software. So if you ever use Samba uh, or Microsoft Windows SMB networking, there's an op-lock caching system in there. So if you're the only person using a file, it's super, super fast. As soon as two people use a file, everything becomes incredibly slow because you're now having to synchronize over the network. Interestingly, exactly the same mechanism is used by multi-core CPUs. So if you see how two cores are running, they have a shared cache area between the two of them. One of them will uplock the stuff inside the cache and become exclusive to that CPU. If two CPUs try to use a cache line at the same time, then it becomes shared and it becomes real slow because you're having to synchronize through that one cache line. So this is, turns up everywhere. You find it all over computing, this method of doing copying stuff. Next way of doing it is to directly map it. So a bit like Anthony was saying there about directly mapped I.O., where you have volatile access, uh, you can just simply map an entire device or the RAM of a different device directly into your, your, your memory space. This is uh, classically NUMA. So I recently bought a new Threadripper CPU uh, because my work time to compile everything was about two hours. And I bought a Threadripper and it's now down to 17 minutes, which is just woohoo, well worth the money. Um, but it is interesting because it's actually a NUMA-based architecture. So the CPU has local RAM to itself, and the other CPUs have different local RAM to themselves. And if you are accessing RAM which is not local to your CPU, you're doubling your access latency times. And I've configured it that way, and the, theoretically, Windows Scheduler is going to do the right thing. I know the Linux one does an awful lot better again. So if you know all of this stuff, uh, you can design your system around it. So don't do uh, atomic accesses to memory that's far away. Uh, and if you do, then you need to use coarse-grained synchronization so you can hide the synchronization cost uh, from doing that. Okay. So here's your third technique, and we kind of alluded to this earlier on. Turn whatever your problem is out of a DMA copy-based system or a, a mapping system into I.O. So just take the entire chunks of kernel app, uh, implementation and just put them onto a device. Classical one of that is graphics rasterization. We did this years and years and years ago. We now have the GPU rendering all of our lines for us because that's expensive. You can nowadays, if you have lots and lots of money, uh, you can give Intel a shocking quantity of money, and they will give you a system whereby basically they put a flash drive onto a DDR4 memory stick. And you can plug that DDR4 memory stick into your Intel custom system. <coughs> And it will implement DDR, well, emulate uh, DDR4 memory. Now, the access latency for that is very interesting. Um, I had to go pull the figures. This literally only came out, I think, a week or two ago. So finding proper benchmarks was hard. But I believe I am correct in saying that the access latency is about four times worse than DDR4 RAM. So it's four times higher. And it's about 50 nanoseconds. And if you look at the kernel page cache implementation, I can't find any or better than about 2,000 nanoseconds, no matter what. So you're getting there a 40-fold performance increase if you are running into kernel page cache simply by outsourcing the entire thing onto this dedicated device. So this is obviously stuff for really rich people, uh, big organizations to go and buy. If that is not what you need to do, you can actually just outsource your entire filing system onto a dedicated hardware device. So if you go ask Samsung really, really nicely for their Z SSD, if you bought a whole load of those, you can ask them for the KV SSD edition, which is just a different firmware. Because on the modern uh, SSDs, the, the, the fast end ones, they actually have a key value store inside implemented internally. Because you have a whole load of flash memory, you need to map out when you're going to use which bits of it and when. You need to handle where, levering, uh, where, where leveling, and so on and so forth. So there's actually a key value store built in there. And Samsung have exposed that to the application layer. So you can get this new firmware. You can set aside a certain portion of the SSD to key value store and directly exposes it. And you can then simply talk to it as a key value store all the time, bypassing entirely the kernel or any filing system or anything else. And you can reduce, I reckon, you can probably do a file system operation about 170 microseconds, probably. It's about, about right. Uh, and the Samsung can do it in about 30. So if you're the kind of situation where you have a big key value store and you need to do a whole load of key value store operations, this 
is a reasonable way of just spending money to get, get, get stuff. So it's basically taking things away from the kernel and putting them into dedicated hardware devices. Now, I should just mention that uh, there is some confounding that can go on. You can have directly mapped devices appear as if they are copy-based, uh, and you can also have copy-based devices appear as if they're directly mapped. So the kernel, for various historical reasons, will do a whole lot of emulation for certain things. Socket I.O. may well be directly mapped, but it will pretend to be copy-based, and so on and so forth. All right, so this is literally the lines I went and wrote when I was in Michael Wong's talk, so we'll see what happens. I'm concluding out of all of this history that's led up until now that um, C++ abstract machine needs to be taught. Some memory is shareable, that shared memory can be modified outside the current C++ program by others, not including volatile. <laughs> some objects are shareable, but not others. And ideally, you're going to want some of them to be trivially shareable. In other words, you can deduce that the C++ compiler can deduce that some of them are shareable without having to do any programming for it, or if it needs to be, you need to have some user-defined customization point to say this stuff is shareable. And one of the key things is that these objects are going to appear at different memory locations in every C++ program sharing the object, so this stuff needs to work. What I have not attempted to solve yet, because it's really hard to get this stuff past the committee as it is, cache coherency, synchronization, uh, I can simply tell you, it's funny, uh, when you're talking to people from the committee, people go, oh, well, isn't the SMP threading model sufficient for this? And I'm like, well, yes, for stuff that runs within an SMP uh, cache coherency protocol. But if you're talking about a fabric connected, a network connected, you know, group of heterogeneous compute clusters, SMP threading model is not going to cut it. Uh, even on GPU, it's hideously inefficient. So if you can not do that, that would be great. But we're just kicking that can down the road as well. Uh, Interprocess communication, when I first raised this paper, people were like, how does each program talk to the other program? I'm saying, I'm not touching that. Uh, it does magic. Who knows? Some proprietary stuff is going to let one program tell another program when to do things. And that's where networking TS comes in and all that other stuff. I don't think it needs to be part of this proposal. So baby steps first. All right, I appreciate that was a whole dump load of uh, theory. Uh, are there any questions before I dig into the prototype proposal papers? Felix. Uh, I think that the libraries today include uh, who offers uh, shared memory to that, something like this. Uh, is this then just working by luck? Or is it something which one can really rely on? So you're talking about boost into process? Yeah, that's by ION, yeah. Uh, that works because the compiler and the operating system provide enhanced and stronger guarantees about memory and uh, semantics that are not in the C++ standard. So uh, even that said, there are some areas in interprocess, as there are actually in boost thread, where one is definitely in it just happens to work land rather than uh, anyone has defined it. I mean, I remember uh, there's a section of Boost Thread where they do termination of TLS handling, where if I remember rightly, they're poking through the PE header at the front of the executable and like poking in some handlers, literally into just undisclosed memory locations. And I don't think any of that's documented, but it works and it has worked for years. So fine, you know, who cares in the end? I mean, that's the whole point of abstraction libraries is to hide that stuff so people, the end users don't have to do it. Um, but certainly, uh, Boost into Process was proposed for standardization, large chunks of it, uh, was it 2008, maybe-ish, around about then, nobody else would know. And I don't think it fared well at the committee, mainly because it relied on the abstract machine to be modified, and that's hard. Is that a reasonable assessment? Anyone who can remember? No? Okay, cool. Any other questions before I move on? No? Okay. All right, so this is the paper, first paper. I'm going to try and summarize it as best as I can. I might add that the draft is quite different from this because of the feedbacks that's been received since. So as I mentioned earlier on, C++ objects are stored in zero, one, or many arrays of bytes. One can reinterpret, cast an object into its byte array, but only for trivially copyable types. So that's the C requirement that one can reinterpret, cast uh, objects into bytes, but we only permit it for C-compatible types currently. If you do it with any other thing, and there's so much C++ code out there which does, undefined behavior. The fact it works is either because the compiler's guaranteed you it will work, which usually it has not, or it just happens to be lucky that it does happen to work. 
If you look at any of the zero copy serialization libraries out there, they're all doing that. They're all casting types to, to byte arrays, and they're just hoping for the best. And just because it happens to work in today's compilers doesn't mean that some future optimization isn't going to break this horribly. So what we don't have is some way of reinterpreting arbitrary C++ objects into an array of bytes. Okay, So you can guess where I'm going to go next. <laughs> What this means is you're going to have to copy memory. So if you want to be well-defined, uh, this is a uh, discussion that came up with boost serialization recently. So Robert Ramey, who, who maintains that library, he was saying that you cannot take, because people are coming along and going, can we not make serialization much faster? And he was saying, well, no, because if it's a non-trivially copyable type, you must serialize it. There must be a serialization step where you convert the non-trivially copyable type into trivially copyable types, and that is the serialization step. And then you must unpack them back out again. That's memory copying. So that's what you're actually doing. You're actually transforming one into the other. And that's why boost serialization is, in inverted commas, slow, although it's not relative to well-defined non-UB uh, solutions. So uh, here we go. So here's the two new operations that are being proposed by the paper. The first is detachment. Now, as with all naming things, everybody's going to hate the naming. Everybody's going to bike shed the naming. Uh, you can call it zombify if you want. You can call it a long list of things, but detachment is the one I chose. So what it does, it, it simply says you uh, are going to take an object, you're going to put it to sleep effectively, so you can convert it into a byte array, and it's going to have some sort of state that's now persisted. Uh, Read-write ordering barrier for the compiler only has to happen. So basically, if you've modified that object and you're now going to go and detach it, any modifications to that object must happen beforehand. So in other words, there's a dependency carrying relationship between modifications of the object and the conversion of it into a byte array. Something very important is that object lifetime ends as soon as you do this. So when you detach an object, its lifetime ends. It's now an array of bytes. It's not the object anymore. It's gone. No memory copying. And if the object you are detaching has no reference to any other objects, they happen to be trivially de detachable. So other references are pointers, references, v pointers. Okay. So this actually covers most C++ types, although how many don't have a pointer? Interesting. Almost certainly it's going to get stuck in committee because uh, they're going to say, well, a uint pointer can be used to store a pointer. And if someone, for example, implemented std vector using uint pointers, rather than using a pointer for the internal representation, then it would be counted as being trivially detachable and attachable, and that would break everything. And I'm like, well, don't use uint pointer. But anyway, um, so here's the first operation. This is the kind of fundamental one. So there's basically a uh, restricted reinterpret cast operator, uh, and I'm called it detach cast, and it takes an input of a sum array of t, and it's going to output an array of byte. So after this operator is finished, unlike reinterpret cast, reinterpret cast permits uh, aliasing. So the item that comes in can be aliased with, with the item that comes out. So you can talk to modify things either way, and the compiler has to assume that you're referring to the same bit of memory. This is different. Detach cast makes any modification of the T that went in after this thing has returned undefined behavior. And that's like compiler says no, you know, if at all possible. You don't do that. Once this has happened, you can only talk to it as bytes. Now, that's a bit hard to use, so I'm proposing that as a free function for a main customization point. Uh, for trivially detachable types, the compiler would default to implement this in-place detach, which has basically got the same input and the same output, but it's a free function in the same normal way as any C++ function. You can make it no except, you can make it throws if you're keen on herb, herb exceptions. You can make it const expert, const val, that's fine. Uh, but the compiler will de default define one of these, and it's defined to be a detach cast if the type contains no pointers or references or v pointers. Does that all reasonably make sense? Any questions? Yes, at the front. So what is the compelling reason to not allow reinterpret cast uh, for non-trivially copyable types? Uh, main one is that reinterpret cast is evil and horrible. <laughs> but to answer your question probably in the way that you were looking for, um, the trouble is that reinterpret cast is a big sledgehammer. 
So it's like C casting. You're going to come along and you're going to so say to the compiler, here's your input, and I just want you to make it this output. And then the compiler goes, well, do you mean that's one way? Do you mean you want to have them both? Are we talking about a union here? Um, and that's the reason why it's made into undefined behavior in the C++ standard. Um, if you do reinterpret cast, all bets are off. Even in the C language, they're running increasingly into problems with the fact that you can see cast everything. And one of the big reasons for the pointer, uh, pointer provenance uh, work that they're just bringing now to the C committee is to drastically reduce um, the optimization scope, uh, or rather enhance it, depending on how you look at it, for when people do reinterpret casting. So at the minute, uh, C compilers are permitted to just completely give up. So as soon as you use reinterpret cast inside a function, uh, it just gives up. And then anything that calls that function, because it's poisonous, will simply give up, and then you find a whole lot of optimizations just vanish. Uh, and the idea with the point of provenance model is that they would be able to try a little bit harder in a more consistent fashion across all C compilers, which is what C++ already does. You know? um, but it, you know, and one of the big things to get this course in C++ is you have to say, as soon as you do reinterpret cast, game over. Um, it's too big and fat and heavy. You know, that's why we have const cast, static cast, anything but reinterpret. Does that answer your question? That's my best understanding of it. So the, the comment was that uh, you want a scalp instead of a hammer so you don't hit the compiler over the head uh, with a sledgehammer. I think that's a reasonable summary in my personal opinion, given my understanding. Uh, Victoria, you had a question? So the question is uh, that when you detach an object that is destructive will not be called at the end scope, that is correct. It is dead. The lifetime is ended. There is no destructor to be called. Finito. So the question is, does that have any, any uh, relationship to relocation semantics? You are getting ahead of yourself. <laughs> There's a question at the back. Yeah. Oh. Uh, more or less the same question today. I also have another question. Is there a reason why that's such a silent and silent thing that's done? Like, you can hear it and so on. Why didn't they attach the brain part? So uh, the question was, is why is it a span of T rather than a single T? Uh, and that's absolutely a valid, and I'll guarantee you that's what's going to be said. Uh, I'll tell you the reason why I have span of T there is because you can make a span really quickly out of a single one, uh, but then equally you could say, well, you can easily make an arrayed version out of a single one as well. I guarantee you if that goes to committee, they're going to replace that with um, a bit like stood bless. So stood bless does one object at a time. I guarantee you they're going to do the same thing. I don't know. Uh, I had notions that if you work in terms of arrays, I'll, I'll tell you one of the reasons I was thinking where this originally came from. I would like uh, polymorphic objects to be detachable, right? This just produces horror in the committee. You know, what do you mean? You can, uh, you know, rewriting viewpointers. Uh, and like, well, you can do it, so why not? <laughs> and if it's an array of objects coming in, if you have to go restamp the viewpointer for an object, it's much more efficient if you have an array of objects being passed in. So if you have uh, a thousand polymorphic objects and you need to restamp the viewpoint on all of those, you can optimize that far more efficiently if you can pass it in an array. So that's where originally it came from because I originally had polymorphic object support in this. I was then told to get rid of the polymorphic object support at all possible costs because it's just terrible. And I said, fine, so I got rid of it. But I'd like to bring it back again. But that's the reason why it's span. Uh, so when I went and did out the modeling code for all of this, it was done on polymorphic objects and arrays thereof, and it's kind of just dripped through into this. Um, and I left it in because it makes people ask the question that you did, which then lets me bring in the polymorphic object argument. So that's why I decided to leave it in. Is that all right? <laughs> <laughs> so the comment was uh, that I should come up with a different rationale because it's not a um, useful, uh, please don't turn it off. Uh, uh, yes, uh, yes, I agree. And almost certainly that's gonna happen before this gets any, any progress on it. Anyway, I'll move on. That's right before the screen goes and kicks off. Uh, object attachment is kind of going to be the exact opposite of uh, the thing you had before. I'm now going to introduce this lovely phrase, reachable C++ programs. Just accept it for what it is, and I'll explain it to you in a minute. Lifetime begins again. 
Uh, I should add that const expert global static data init at process launch gets redefined into a detachment and attachment. So at the minute, if you have uh, const expert static data, uh, the compiler may choose to pre-calculate the binary representation of an initialized object and put it in at link stage into your, into your um, uh, application binary. So when you come along to your statically const with sta ah, let me say this again. So objects with const expert constructors can be pre-calculated by the compiler and put into static memory. When you come along to use them, there's no actual runtime code done because it's pre-constructed. Its representation of memory is already done. So that would be effectively this. So if you have const expert uh, uh, constructors, as of course all our types do, don't we? Uh, then that would become redefined as attachment attachment. And that sort of gives you an idea of what's going on here. You have a Predefined byte array, and it's being basically livened into a real life object. So, this is basically exactly the same as it was before, except it's a cast. Now, you might wonder to yourself why is detachment and attachment two separate operations? And the reason why is because there are objects out there which can be attached but never detached. Yes, I know, when you start thinking that through and you're going, hmm, well, what kind of objects would those be? And if you think it through, let's just say we had binary module loading support in some future language. That'd be great. So if you came along and you said, you know, I want this module to be loaded into my program right now at runtime, uh, you're going to have to go off and initialize all of its static variables when you load, load it in. Most of those are going to be in copyright, uh, copy and write, uh, page fault initialized, because you see you're going to map them in from storage. And then when you come along and you write into those data, you're going to page fault them into private local memory. And that's a one-way operation. You can attach those things, but you cannot detach them. Because once it's been copied and written, that's a private anonymous page, and it's a one-way operation. There's actually quite a few objects throughout C++ which are only one way in that sense. Yes? So the question is, is what happens if you have a uh, set array of bytes So the question is, if you have a set of bytes which are not a valid representation of a type, then how do you get around that? And that is undefined behavior. So you're saying, is it like BitCast? BitCast only works with trivially copyable types. So BitCast will refuse to compile with a non-trivially copyable type. You're saying it's like BitCast, but for non-trivially copyable types, but the answer is no, because uh, BitCasting does not cause the creation of objects under the abstract machine. It simply causes a reinterpretation, which is different, whereas this creates objects or destroys objects under the abstract machine. And I know that's such an anodyne thing to go and say, because you know it makes no difference, but it makes all the difference to C++ compiler writers, apparently. Is that all right? <laughs> Yeah, I know this, this, I'm going to get completely ruined at the next uh, Cologne meeting on this because I can see myself sitting in SG12 and they're just going to rip pieces out of this. But, you know, I'm not a language lawyer, you know, I just want memory map files in the language. Uh, anyway, so reachable C++ programs. This is kind of super duper important. It's going to make everyone in the room very disappointed. <laughs> so it has to be one of the following three definitions. Currently running C++ program only. This is the current model in C++20. Here's the other next one. Sequential executions of the unmodified current C++ program over time, where at least modification to shared storage is made available to subsequent executions of the same C++ program. This may not look particularly big. You're like, so your program saves some stuff, and when it runs again, it loads some stuff in that it previously saved and what's the big deal? The weird thing is that this appalls people in that whole area of thing. The whole idea that programs, C++ programs, don't run the same way every single time you run them is still a very hard thing for people to wrap their heads around. I'm very glad that Anthony had mentioned that threads allow them to not do that because I'm gonna bring that up. I'm gonna say, Anthony said, <laughs> that, you know, you can have multiple sequential orderings. And how about we just push that boat out a little bit further and we allow the fact that some objects can be written to, and when you run the program again, you're going to see those modifications to those objects. I know it's, it's such a small thing, because we've been doing it for 40-odd years, 
But uh, that's, that's, that's another definition of reachable C++ programs. Ready for the big one? Here comes the big one. So you can also define your C++ implementation to permit many instances of the unmodified current C++ program, where the modified shared storage can be passed between concurrently executing instances, including across heterogeneous compute. So this opens the door, if they accept it, to having a shared memory region, and that shared memory region is shared between all instances of identical C++ programs, and if you go and put objects into those shared regions, you will be able to interoperate between multiple instances of your C++ program, but it has to be identical. This is very key. So, I mean, by identical, I mean identical compiler, identical flags, identical binary in every way, identical architecture, no differences. Now, a whole lot of people are gonna say, well, that means that you can't do a long list of stuff. That it means all of the shared library or shared memory support is gonna not work. And I'm gonna go, yes, that will still remain to be undefined behavior of today, but this is better than what we had before. You can now at least have some notion in the language of there being shared memory and that you can actually put objects into it and have them cooperate. And that's something we don't have at the minute. And again, baby steps is all I can say. Um, the reason why this is so important is because there's a long list of assumptions throughout the abstract machine that objects are in intimately tied into the individual C++ program in front of you. So in other words, can you imagine if you change a single compiler flag to say to change structure padding, you completely change the data representations in there. If you change a single macro, you might change completely the data representation in there. So it has to be an identical program in every single way. Otherwise, the complexity and modifications required to the standard become untenable. You just can't do it. So it has to be identical. And Notice here that I haven't included that it has to be necessarily the same CPU. So one CPU might be fast, one CPU might be slow, they might be connected by a network, and I think that still holds under the proposal I'm making here, I hope. So we'll see what happens. Felix, yes. You're forgetting the detachment stage, but yes. So, in fact... In fact, that's actually literally the next slide. That's right, it's no problem. By the way, uh, the, the funny-looking smiley is because I had a proper smiley in there, and when I went to render the pages, so it was in the editor view, as soon as you went to the, the listing view, the smiley didn't turn up. So that's the reason why the smiley kind of stands out there. Well, he's an anti-smiley. Uh, oh, Jesus, I forgot about this. There is a slide coming on exactly what you just said that will answer your question. Can I defer that question until then? Cool. So yes, there's actually some more work that has to be done before you can properly detach and attach things. Um, so I'm gonna run through it here. If you were to implement this here to attach to other program, the trouble is that your in-place attach implementation is still subject to dead store elimination. So in other words, just because you convert it to bytes doesn't mean that this is a one-way guaranteed thing because there's no atomicity in here. I mean, the compiler can still compile out parts of the writes. So you need to go and do something to tell it to not eliminate dead stores. And I believe Atomic Signal Fence, which is one of the worst named functions for what it does, because it is not atomic <laughs> at all in any way, is actually a uh, reordering fence for the compiler only. And it's actually a C function. So when you say here, memory order sequential consistency, you're simply saying to the compiler, all writes that you have pending, please, please write them. Don't reorder any reads or writes over this thing, but don't tell the CPU about that I'm doing any of this at all. This is a purely 100% uh, C, sorry, compiler-based fence. Is anyone familiar with atomic signal fence? Have you used it in your own code? Oh, guy, you've used it in your own code. Yeah, I've used this in my own code too, quite a lot, because if I want to like tell the compiler to do what I told you, <laughs> it, it, it's a portable way of just saying, just do it, don't do crazy re-optimization. When I'm doing my, my timing calculations, just, just, just do what I tell you. And it's very, very handy for doing that, and yet, wrong name, it's such the wrong name. I mean, it's not a signal fence, it's not atomic. It should just be called fence, or compiler fence, is what it should be called. Anyway, that's my gripe with that over. After you've made sure that all the bytes have been written, you now must tell the abstract machine that the bytes are now indeterminate, because if you don't do that, you're breaking the abstract machine's assumptions about values. So weirdly, um, did anyone know that you can call a destructor of a byte? 
Yes, yes, we have quite a few people who said so. Is this because you read Richard Smith's paper on implicit low-level object creation? No. no? You knew this beforehand? Ah, oh, Jesus. Okay, so I did not know that until I read Richard Smith's paper, and I'm like, oh, okay. So, and, and this actually does something, and the other answer is it doesn't. Not in terms of code, but it does tell the abstract machine that this is now full of indeterminate values. So that makes them out of scope. They're now out of, the, of purview. And I think that is sufficient to detach an object, get it into a byte array, make sure the byte array is fully written, because if you didn't, when you call the destructor down here, you're going to cause dead store elimination if you don't have the atomic signal fence. So I think this is sufficient to make an object in shared memory available to another C++ program. Does anyone think that it wouldn't? No? OK, cool. Yeah, cool, cool. Uh, yeah. And yeah, OK. So if we're going to reattach it back in on the other side of the other C++ program, here's an interesting one. We're going to mem move the incoming byte array to itself, right, of the size. Now, uh, can anyone explain why that is the case? Would anyone like to volunteer? Why are we mem moving to the self? Timor, yeah? My best guess is that's correct. So the C++ abstract machine uh, has been given some bytes, which it thinks might be indeterminate. So you need to tell it before you do anything else, otherwise you're going to UB, that they are now full of objects. And I'm basically relying on Richard Smith's paper when he said that you can either bless a memory range, or you can mem move it to itself. So if Richard Smith said it. I'm going to guess that he's probably right. So yeah, it does nothing, because any optimizing compiler is going to look at that and it's going to go, that means nothing. But it does, in the abstract machine, make it full of live valid objects. And then what you do is you simply convert the byte array back into a live object. Does that seem reasonable? So here we go. Here's an answer to um, Felix's question. So you've got shared memory. You would detach, you would do some sort of inter-procedural communication, inter-process communication, the other side reattaches. For memory map storage, you would detach, program ends, program begins, reattach. And that's how you get back your storage. You've got, interestingly, object relocation. So because you can turn something into a byte array, you can detach, mem copy it somewhere else, reattach it. Yeah, so far so good. It's going to get a bit more fun again, because now we can change what moves do. Because if we can relocate things in memory, we can start moving a whole lot of stuff around much more efficiently than before. And we get that long, long held thing, destructive moves, which has failed at every committee proposal until now, which is probably another reason why this proposal will fail. But hey, I've named the types which are capable of being moved, byte copyable. Uh, that's almost certainly going to get byte shedded into death. It small, solves the small value C++ ABI inefficiency. I should probably explain that. So you, I don't know if how many people know this, but std vector usually consists of an allocator instance, and if it's a default allocator, that's nothing. It usually consists of a pointer to the beginning of its storage array and a pointer to the end of its storage array. So there's actually two pointers in size most of the time. If you return a std vector from a function, despite the fact that it's only two CPU registers in size, you must store it on the stack and transmit it through the stack because it's non-trivially copyable. So it has a non-trivial uh, destructor. So the C++ ABI must store it on the stack, must transport it through the stack, and there's no alternative to this. If you have the ability to say that this thing's byte copyable because it's just two registers, you could throw it at two registers and fire it back through register transport, then you can now improve the C++ ABI for all small value objects. This is something that relates to uh, what Herb was talking about uh, in his presentation yesterday that as we move further and further forward to C++, we're getting ever better at making value semantics in C++ more efficient, more fast, more capable. I agree this breaks ABI, but hey, we get to do that every 10, 15 years, like GCC did with GCC 5, so why not, especially if it brings a whole lot of extra advantages. Tibor, you had a question, hand up. So the comment was that a uh, unique pointer is often assumed by people to have no runtime overhead over a raw pointer, but because of its non-trivial copyability, in fact it does, because it forces stack-based transport rather than CPU register-based transport, and that is an excellent observation. That would go away with this. 
It's one of those things that just annoys me. I mostly spend my time looking at assembly output when I'm working with C++, and it just irritates me when I see needless moves. I just don't want to see them. They all cost like three CPU cycle latency. Ah, you know, I know see <laughs> three CPU to cycle latency, you know, is like, huh? But it annoys me because it doesn't need to be there. It could be zero. Do no work. The fastest form of work is doing nothing. And I like to do nothing in my, my, my um, programming. So because of that, you can include your non-trivial destructors, include CPU register storage, and yes, it would be an ABI break, but hey, we can do that. It can happen from time to time. And something interesting is that at the minute, um, getting C++ objects of any complexity, i.e. non-trivially copyable ones, through C code is a pain in the hole, basically, because you have huge trouble uh, with, with copyability. Unless it's trivially copyable, C can't speak it. Now, if it's byte copyable, you can, because you can detach it, hand it off to C code, C code can go and mem copy it to its heart's content, and when you reattach it when you re-enter C++, it's completely usable, and that's a huge boon if you ever have to get C++ to talk to any other language, because they all speak C, they don't speak C++. Like Python, you know? Okay, so missing parts. Uh, I haven't figured out a way that will be acceptable to uh, SG12 yet of how to make stuff containing dynamic memory allocations byte copyable. The simplest solution is to add an equals relocate to the move constructor, right? Simple, easy, straightforward. But the trouble is I can guarantee people are gonna, gonna go, oh, I wanna get in there and mess with the internals because you know something simple will be too big. Why can't I get an implementation detail? So what we might do there is we might split attach to attach into sub-operations. Uh, I'm gonna suggest reanimate and zombify. Um, because that's basically what you're doing. So it would be a subclass that would apply to a wider set of things, like anything containing a pointer or a reference, uh, and it means you can't send it to other processes, but you can kill it and bring it back to life. And there's something else. Uh, Arthur Dwyer is currently working very hard to get this um, paper through the committee. Uh, he's having some success, I think. I mean, he certainly seems to keep at it, but it's tough. Um, I think he can't avoid modifying the abstract machine. And if he's gonna modify the abstract machine, which we don't like doing, you might as well modify it to do a whole load of extra stuff using the same modifications than just implementing move and object relocation. And these proposed changes get you shared memory, get you concurrency, get you persistence of data objects, and a long list of other stuff, and they give you object relocation. And I personally think if you're gonna break the, or sorry, modify, the abstract machine, you get a lot more bang for your buck if you go down this route rather than going down Arthur's route. Now that said, there's a whole lot of stuff there that can be merged into this and maybe that's what the committee will do when they come to see it. And that'd be great. Okay, so that's the link to the paper when the slides go up. Uh, it's not published yet, so you're not gonna see it until clone. Uh, so don't try clicking on it yet. You can find drafts of it kicking around. As soon as this conference ends, I will almost certainly output another draft and it'll go to the usual places. All right, uh, last bit, I know there's about 15 minutes to go. So this is the second part, which is to teach the C++ abstract machine about memory pages. Because right now, memory is a flat space. And I think it needs to know that it's not. So the motivating reason why we need this is that if you have one C++ reachable program, and you are talking to another reachable C++ program, you need to say, I have an object here that I need you, I want to share with you. And because addresses can be completely different between the two machines, depending on where the memory map happens to land, you need some process independent way of uniquely identifying this object between multiple processes across all reachable C++ programs. So that's a motivating cause. Uh, it needs to be fast, it needs to work well over a network, uh, and Here's this pointer provenance stuff, which I will not be talking about, but the idea is that if you were to implement a memory hygiene provenance checking model, it should work across all reachable C++ programs. I know, wonderful. Just like run a validator and just says, your program's correct. So great. So um, it's very fast to figure out what memory pages a object belongs to, because you just do a page table walk, same as the CPU already does on your behalf. Uh, I have written on many occasions throughout my career a routine that figures out where an object is stored. So you hand a pointer to a routine, and it'll come back and tell you, this belongs to the program, belongs to a thread, it's automatic duration, stored in the stack, uh, and that way then you have some idea of its shareability. 
It could be very, very fast if the operating system helped you out. Currently, they do not. So you're talking probably milliseconds to implement this in the minutes. But there's nothing to say that this couldn't be implemented way, way, way faster. And that way then, in a validating C++ implementation, it could come along and say, you are trying to share a stack-based object. No. Or even better, the compiler will come along and say, no, you must put shared objects into shared memory, because then I can share them. You cannot share non-shareable memory. So that's where I'm aiming for, that there's some validatable item inside there. And that basically summarizes this. Can anyone think of any situation where you would be able to share a private anonymous page? No? Not even with child processes, forking? No? I couldn't think of one either, so I'll just move on. <laughs> All of these lovely, fun things. Great stuff, of course. You have proprietary APIs that do all of this already on all of the major systems. And of course, it's now into POSIX 2017. Uh, but wouldn't it be great if from standard C++ or even C, you could do all of this stuff as well? I've already covered a whole chunk of that in 1031, which is the low-level file I.O. Uh, proposal. It does a full memory, virtual memory management API, which is standardized. But until the abstract machine is in place, you can't actually get that past the committee. Um, so you have to get this done. I'm just trying to think here now. Yes. So I tried to reduce down the number of changes which I felt would be needed, the absolute bare minimum that you need to teach the abstract machine about memory pages, because anything more than minimums doesn't stand a chance. I think you need to teach it that there are pages of memory. I think that's doable, uh, that memory is not entirely homogenous. And more importantly, there are pages of varying sizes. So you could have your object stored in a 4K page and then a one megabyte page immediately afterwards. I think that's doable. I think you just need to know that pages can be, ah, wrong button, I'm getting tired, indeterminate, that matches the abstract machine's current idea of indeterminate values for some arbitrary range of memory. Uh, pages can be private, so there's a local copy of that page that I and only I can see as a process. There are pages which are shared, so it's potentially the case that one or more CPP, uh, C++, reachable C++ programs can see it. I think copy and write is unavoidable. I think it's very wise to keep it in anyway because of static data initialization and potentially in the future you might have loadable uh, shared binary modules. And then here's an interesting one, clean. Can anyone think of why you'd want the abstract machine to know about clean pages? doesn't need to read them. Pretty much. So uh, I'll give you an example. If you knew an array uh, at the minute of some arbitrary type that has a all bit zero default initializer, it's going to go and allocate the memory, and it's going to write zeros into every single section of that memory. But memmap, when you call it, returns you a set of memory full of all bit zero. So at the minute, the trade-off that, that C++ currently does is it goes off and it writes zeros into a thing full of already full of zeros, because it's pre-faulting the memory into existence such that later on when you go to access, it's going to be quick to access. But I was just telling Herb there at, at lunchtime that this is unfortunately not quite always true anymore. So a few months ago, I had an interesting weird quirk in my unit test case on Windows. And uh, I was debugging and going, what's the CPU process just chewing up all of the CPU time all the time uh, during my, while my test run was happening? And it turned out that there was a kernel process that was going off and comparing memory pages all the time, and it was comparing them for quality. And it was looking for various all bit zero pages, and it was basically coalescing them. And Herb was like, Windows doesn't do that. <laughs> Linux does things like that. And I said, well, I swear to you, this is the case. And I think it was because I have Hyper-V enabled on my Windows machine. So when you turn on the Hyper-V, it puts a different kernel in, and I think it starts up different processes, and I think that's where the cause was. So I spent my time trying to kick it to, sell, to stop killing my cache locality because it was ruining my test. But it's definitely getting to the point now where systems are going off and doing stuff, like even if you pre-fault a page into existence, if it happens to be full of all zeros, if it happens to be identical to another page, it's starting to eliminate copies and things like that. I'm not sure down the way that it's not going to be the case that you can rely that writing zeros into an already zeroed item is going to keep it sticking around in perpetuity. So me personally, I would like to teach the C++ abstract machine 
that it has the ability to allocate pages which are page faulted into existence, or it, there are pages which are locked into existence. And that way, then, it would know the difference. Um, I don't know if the abstract machine needs to know that itself, but if it does know that pages are clean, then it can certainly avoid having to write zeros into something that already reads full of zeros. So I don't know. It's an idea and certainly going to be up for discussion. We're very nearly at the end of the talk, uh, so I'll be able to release you in a few minutes' time. Uh, I'm just thinking there in the future, it'd be great if you could detach and attach whole arrays of pages. Uh, if you had reflection, there's actor-based concurrency applications. You can gift and splice pages to zero copy I.O. So one of the great things there is you can prepare a set of pages, you can hand it off to the kernel and say, just give that there to the network card and blat that off to wherever you need it to go. Dynamically loaded modules. And then, of course, the holy grail that I've been chasing for oh, 15 years. It really annoys me that malloc can't modify the page tables of the local process. It just irks me. There's absolutely no technical reason why it cannot. They're there. They can just be written to do a TLB flush. You can also implement memcopy by messing around with the page tables in the local process. There's, again, there's no technical reason why this can't happen. And instead of having to copy 4K pages around the place and ruining your cache locality and stepping all over everything, you could just relocate them, just take them from where they are and put them somewhere else, all in user space. There's no reason why we can't do it, and I would love if we could have that. I tried proposing it to C years and years and years and years ago, and they just went, please go, go ask POSIX. When I went and asked POSIX, they went, no. <laughs> you know, who knows? Anyway, I'm not going to say anything about this paper at all, except that I think it basically brings C's memory model into C++'s. Devil's in the corner cases. There's been an argument running this entire week due to the emails I posted to the Undefined Behavior Study Group, and it's ongoing, where people are like arguing over corner case interpretations of pointer provenance such that are pointers with the same address equal? Because, interestingly, they may not be. So you apply operator equals, and you'll get a different result to mem compare on, on the same pointers. Uh, and there's people with weird compilers that have weird pointers that are always value different, even if they refer to the same object, things like that. And that's completely valid. That's within the standard. You can have two pointers to the same object that have completely different binary representations, and that's supposed to work. And it's Apparently, it does work. Uh, but what I will say is that the provenance stuff has no Rust-style memory hygiene enforcement. Sad panda. Because I was really hoping they would, and they do not. I wanted, like, unsafe blocks. So there we go. Um, before I finish up, I just want to say thank you very much, ACCU, for having me for the last you know, few years and talking. I'm sorry that I won't be back again in the near future, but uh, thanks for coming to pay, you know, my talks, and um, thanks for all the comments online. And uh, hopefully, I'll see you all in the next few years. <laughs>